This is introduction to Chisel. Uh, what is Chisel? I think you all probably have a little bit of an idea here, but it's a hardware construction language. Um, we use take advantage of modern programming paradigms to help generate hardware. Uh, history we started in 2010, and more and more people seem to be interested. All right, this is a pretty good slide. Um, <laughs> Says you can ask me anything, so I'd like this to be as interactive as possible. But uh, I think the way Edward had planned on doing this was to just sort of just do a brief warm-up thing, and then we can take this wherever you guys really want to go. Uh, he has a bunch of, of things, and hopefully he'll be here by the time we get into the more interactive part. So, um, actually, my name is Chick Markley. I'm a staff at the Adept Lab. I, I am Chisel support, so I. People have problems with Chisel, they call in, and I try to help, or they don't call in, you know, Stack Overflow questions and issues and things like that. I'm one of the people who tries to solve those things. Um, so that being said, I don't actually program in Chisel very much at all. I don't use Chisel to build circuits. I more try to figure out what the problems are with other people. And I'm part of the development team, so new features that are being added to Chisel, that's stuff that I work on all the time. Um, Best way to learn Chisel. Um, I, I think where we are with our boot camp, I don't know if any of you have tried that, but I think that's um, we are getting better and better at presenting and uh, figuring out the right mix of how to train on Scala and how to train on Chisel itself. So I would highly recommend if you haven't started with that, you, you do that, and I think it's a good reference for a lot of good practices. Um, once you've gotten past that, you really probably will not be programming very much in a Jupyter Notebook. Uh, it's, a, it's a great way to get started, but it isn't really the way it works. Um, so typically, you will start from a template of some sort, and these are two of the more common ones. There is also a more rocket-based one, uh, which in my slide in the next section, I, or in the next session, I will have a thing for that. But there is a, a thing called a project template also, which is, yes? So if you just wanted to start with uh, rocket, or even um, one of these, what's kind of the minimum requirements? How big a laptop, how much RAM, you I, know? Yeah, I, I would say 16 gigs is probably what you need to get going with, with Rocket. Um, I think most of the people who develop that actually are using uh, bigger servers, and, servers. Then, and then you know tunneling through to the servers and working from there. I don't work on Rocket. Um, uh, Ed, Edward uh, does, so you, you may have some better references. But that's a yeah, it's a pretty big project and it links in a bunch of stuff. So, um, well, on the other hand, if you're just using VI or Emacs to edit it, I, I don't think that you know the development overhead isn't particularly high. But it's it is a it's a pretty big thing to build depending yeah. on the, the configuration that you're using. Okay. Um, just a couple of slides about where the documentation is. Um, we are continuing to work on this. It's uh, you know not I would say the not the best part of Chisel, um, but I think as we've emphasized before too, we would welcome any help. So if you're ever using the documentation, you find anything wrong with it, please just shoot us something and uh, someone will, uh, will make it better. Okay, debugging resources. Uh, the website has the standard list of things. Uh, Chisel's user group is a good place to ask questions. There's also a chat room in Gitter, if anyone uses that. Um, I think it's kind of getting to be sort of like uh, if you own a restaurant and you have, uh, you have DoorDash and Caviar, and you know, I've seen these places where they have five things and they're trying to manage all that. But it really doesn't matter. Use one of these. I, I think Stack Overflow, I really encourage people to use that as the primary, like, I tried this and it didn't work. You know, filing an issue for that is probably not a problem with the software. It's probably just uh, something with our documentation, or there's just a, you know, a quick answer, and the Stack Overflow is better for that. If you think that you have an actual bug in Chisel, then it's that's an, that should be an issue that should get filed. Um, generally, you start with Chisel three issues, but sometimes people will say, oh, that really is a fertile problem. You know, so there's a little bit of winding that way through, but we'll usually take care of all that stuff. Um, we recommend a test-driven development model. That is, you when you write when you're building something, you think about how it's supposed to work, and as you build it, you write a series of tests that test that it's there. I, I think in the hardcore version, you you actually write the test first. It will fail because nothing implements it yet, and then 
you try to build your stuff to meet the test. Uh, this is an example on the screen here of using the uh, of how the chisel testers and uh, works. And so it's a, this is the peak poke model that was described yesterday. Uh, this is a, a fine slide. I'm not sure what he's trying to, <laughs> to convey. Um, it's more sophisticated. Not just the lumpy case. Yeah, I, I H, yeah. I get well. I think, I, I guess that's it. I think HDL. You actually build the cake in some other environment, and then something translates that cake. Uh, you know, to, to make another one, or whereas in hardware construction languages, so chisel on the right. I think this is the the, the good side of the slides. This is a. It's just a process. It's a better way of describing what it is that you want done, and so you should get a better cake, and also you should be able to make more cakes after that, so they give a man a fish thing. Uh, so why EDSL? EDSL is embedded dis, uh, domain specific language, that is Chisel is a, is a language, but it's in embedded in the Scala language. Gives you full access to all the capabilities of Scala, which is uh, a, a very modern, uh, rich, uh, I think very useful language in a lot of different ways. Chisel and Risk Five. Uh, this is sort of the breakdown. So Risk Five is is, a, is an ISA. It's just a description of the way things should work. Chisel is a way of building things. So as it says, you can use Chisel to build processors, in particular processors that use the the Risk Five ISA. Chisel's development was spurred largely by the the effort being uh, done at Berkeley to create a Risk Five chip. Or, or certainly the, the the following generations after the first RISC V chip, um, and it is um, we think it has been proven to be able to produce good big chips with very small teams, and so that's a I think that's a testament to its thing. Uh, you can use Chisel support with F. Uh, does Chisel support FPGAs? Yes, you can do that. I would say there's a whole section of our lab with people who don't really know anything about building chips who are using FPGAs to do acceleration. Um, the, our lab collaborates with the, the lab downstairs where there's a lot of genomics research done, and they're using they're building accelerators every day that just help accelerate something some genomic analysis. And so they just run on uh, uh, Amazon F1 instances, which have big FPGAs on them. They you know have some particular big data set that they want to crunch. They build a an FPGA, and then they uh, pipe data through it, and they get it done way quicker than they could. And they don't ever bother or think about building a chip to do that, because the next day they're building a different circuit. Okay, this is uh, a little testament to Scala here, native support for embedded languages. I think uh, uh, basically that's saying it, the way Scala is, the chisel looks better in it than it chisel would look if we embedded it in some other language. Python being the main other thing that people wish that it was embedded in. Um, I think that's largely true. That doesn't mean it wouldn't have been good in Python, or there isn't other reasons for making it Python. But for now, we are we are in Scala. Uh, what Scala does do is it. I think it, um, in some ways, is if you are committed to it, is has a, a lot of things that make it a, a better than average language. It's. Uh, <coughs> It has functional stuff, which um, I think is not that important. But I, I think that the, pr the practical implications of functional stuff is really important. But you don't really need to think of it as functional programming. Object-oriented programming, I think, is uh, has relatively well established as a good model for putting things together. And we certainly take advantage of the object support in in that. Um, yeah. Of course. So what's the reason you did this Scala compared to C++? You know, I want to know, because we have object oriented in C++, we have all of these features. I tried, I, I don't know, I, I have yeah. no idea about Scala. Yeah. I'm a C++ guy, and I want to know, what was the reason they selected you know, Scala? Uh, I, you know, I think at the bottom, this is, 
effort of a team to pick something, and so like everything else, people brought their own biases to the table and what they were familiar with. Mm -hmm. um, Scala, I, you know, I, I think some people would argue maybe it's a little easier to understand the Scala language and that the, the bar barriers to entry are smaller. Um, but I, 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 I don't think there's a great reason. I, I, I do think the embedding is part of it. I think that the way that when you look at a chisel uh, module description, I think that looks more like a special language that's really about building chips. In C++, those things tend to look like I'm going to create an object thing, and then I'm going to call an add an I.O., and then I'm going to call add this, and I'm going to make a wire. It, it ends up looking, it just looks like C++, which I, I'm not saying is bad, but it is a different way of looking at the problem. I, I, don't, I don't think there's a strong... It could have been done in C++, and you know, I, I, I guess I would argue that we, I think we've got where we are faster. Uh, I think the tools available and the programming um, paradigms are, are a little better in Scala than C++. Um, likewise, I think Scala is better than Java for a lot of reasons. I think Java is heavily redundant and verbose. You know, every time you create something, you have to declare its type and then assign something of that type to it. It just gets I don't know. Uh, I think Scala is a pretty good compromise there, but it, it's it, there's nothing magic. Maybe it's there's because you know because of, because it is easier, yeah. I, mean, can I think it's know, easier. It's much, much uh, easier, so more complicated. Maybe. It is. Um, I, I would ideally you would say well Java is a little bit more portable as well, mm -hmm. um, and I think at to the first level it is. But once you start doing anything serious, you always have the problems of backends and do they compile on this thing. But at the chisel level, like just building circuits and creating fertile, um, I, I think Java is a little more portable, so it's easier. We can run on Windows, or we can run on Linux, or we can run on Mac, and that's all. Edward, um, this is uh, Edward Wang. Um, a little delayed, but so I will let you see. You can just use my laptop for now. All right. I mean, the slides should be the same. I think you're trying to say yes. Yeah. The only thing is, I can't work on finishing up our slides. Oh, that's okay. No, no, no. Well, but we got the video going and everything. So let's okay. just, let's just right. do it. Okay. I will wait. All right. What's the next question? <laughs> Why Scala? We, we actually are asking it again to spice your. Okay. Well, I mean, you can read the slide. <laughs> And the question was, yes. you know, that, you know, why not C++, for example? You know, we know that. What's the, you know, but actually, we okay. got the answer. Yeah, I think it's related to the first two points. It's hard to hard to build C, build domain-specific languages in a principled way in C++. Mm -hmm. Like, we want to build them using object-oriented programming, not using a, a macro preprocessing or things like that. And also, I think Scala's object-oriented programming support is much more sophisticated than that of C++. I would also like to make a comment on that. Um, functional programming languages sort of have a, a tradition of doing things that are uh, have like sort of a compiler feel to them, and that's essentially what uh, Chisel is. is it's a hardware language compiler where you take sort of this embedded DSL, and then you you go through a series of transformations from one type to the next in order to eventually come down to something like Verilog or or a C plus plus implementation or something like that. Um, so for sure, there's, there's I, I think, a cultural heritage that comes along with that. Because you can do those sorts of things in C++, of course, now, uh, with modern C++. Um, but there's a not as much of a, a heritage for that, I would say. Thank you. And so when, when yesterday, uh, I, I tried to run the boot camp. Mm -hmm. And um, the, it always showed that initializing Scala is a return. I install the kernel of BIOS law, uh, kernel, and uh, it doesn't work. Okay. Uh, maybe we can take a look at it. Yeah, I think we'll session. take a look at it offline. It, it works for us out of the box, so you should feel free to just follow, follow the instructions on the Chisel Bootcamp readme. But we can debug it offline. Okay, next question. Uh, where is the Bootcamp readme? Feel free to scan it with your phone. <laughs> Does that work? Yeah, it's a QR code. It should work. What's the range? Sorry. Anyway, I, 
like the QR codes. I think that's a nice touch. Did that work? <laughs> it worked. <laughs> Sweet. So there you go. <laughs> Beth <Bathroom. Yep. laughs> Yeah, I think thankfully it's big enough that you can scan it from <laughs> the back of the room. All right, uh, next question. This will be a very boring intensive if there are no well, questions. Well, I sort of was kind of leading through your, it seems like your initial slides are more of an introduction, and oh, then okay. maybe we would go dive deeper, but I'm. <laughs> but we can run this anyway. Okay, I mean, do yeah, I? I'd be happy to dive deeper, only because I don't feel I need the motivation of already mm -hmm. here. Yeah. So I could get past the whys, maybe? Yeah, the hows. <laughs> All right, so the people have questions. So, uh, yeah. Anyone who's tried to use Trisla have questions about why SVT is necessary? Uh, maybe not why SVT is necessary, but um, is there documentation on the relationship between SVT version and Scala version and Java version about what's compatible and what's not? Yeah, a lot of it's a simple, uh, simple compiler. Okay. Simple well, it's a, it's a simple build tool. Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, it, we spend a lot of time, and uh, Jim Lawson downstairs is our. We have a whole de person dedicated to the release engineering, which is mm -hmm. tracking all those different things. Mm -hmm. So SBT is there mostly because well, one of the things that Java brings, you know, good and bad, is that, that runs on a JVM, so it runs in a virtual environment, and so that in order to run Java or Scala, you have to run the virtual environment. So SBT is largely concerned with bringing that environment up in a, in a way that's configured the way that you want and making sure that everything matches and that the libraries you wish that you had are provided. I mean, and just to add to that, theoretically, you could call the Scala C, like the command line Scala compiler directly, but then you're responsible for downloading like the chisel jars and all of its dependencies. Okay. Like you can like right. download all the jars and add them to your class path and then call Scala C file yeah. by file by file. And then Basically, the idea is SVT, Maven, on these kinds of Java-like build tools just do all that for you. So, yeah, that's the reason why they're prevalent. So, SBT is a source of, is, is a pain point, I think, for a lot of people, including us, and it does a lot of things for us, so it's hard to get away from it. We are actively always looking at alternatives. Like and MIL. MIL is, oh, yeah, okay, you got MIL <laughs> in there. So, MIL is a, a pretty high-powered Scala developer just finally... Uh, lost it and said, I can't use SBT anymore, and is, is working quite hard to build his own system that runs faster and is a little lighter weight. Um, and so we actually do have mill support. Uh, more, it's mostly on the development side, so that we, we build Chisel ourselves so that we can distribute it on mill, but I, I suspect that that will be out there as an, an alternative, and that there may be others. I guess yeah. there's a, some people are using Bazel yeah. and a couple other things. But, um, I think so. I guess well, for better or for worse, like unfortunately, SVT is still the default we recommend because I think the mail is not quite yeah. ready yet for. Yeah, no, I I think it's where it is, but I just, if you are frustrated, you are not alone, and we are we doing everything we can to make that better. Seems like you have some questions. No, no, I was just uh, I was curious. I, there are times when it wasn't clear which Scala version I was supposed to use, like which version of the language, and right. which well, one matches. One, and that's not for you guys yeah. necessarily, that's the larger community where I have to find that. Right, it well. should be that if you're using the, the standard release stuff, everything should be correct. Yeah. Okay. Uh, where we get into problems is if, uh, you know, it's hard not to, particularly if you're you're starting and you want to use more exotic features, To if you use the, the master versions of, of the projects, those things kind of go in and out of sync sometimes as we, as we change things, and it takes uh, a little bit of time, which Jim is on <laughs> as best mm. he can be, to uh, ripple through so that everything is consistent. I think but, ge generally, if, like, if I'm starting a Trezor project, I'll usually use one of these templates, and usually I copy the build.svt file, and that includes like a correct version of the Scala yeah. version and okay, a fine. correct SVT version. Usually that's enough. Yeah. Like for example, if you're if you're trying to write your own build at SPT, there's like a little trickery with regards to Scala 212 and Chisel. Yeah. But if you're using the default template that includes all the compatibility for, compatibility okay. flags out of the box. Cool. So just if you use the templates, then you don't have to worry about writing the build at SPT, which simplifies a lot. Yes. One small suggestion I have for a slide like this: mm -hmm. probably not a good idea to put two QR codes on there at once. Why does it not know which one to scan? Oh, it scanned one. I don't know which one I got. <laughs> I, can't, I can't select which one I, I want. All right. Thankfully, they're both valid. <laughs> so they'll, they'll both get you to a chisel template. Yeah, but yeah, we'll.
try to disambiguate it a bit more. Okay, so is everyone done ragging about SVP? <laughs> Can we, yeah. how you know the slides? You know, like we can, yeah, yes. if we can, we can share the slides. Yeah, 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 we haven't, we haven't put together, but we'll, we'll be sharing all the slides from yesterday and today. Okay. 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 Yeah. okay. Uh, any other burning questions, or should we just move to the next slide? Come on, no, no burning questions. No. Yes. It only get worse. Uh, this, sure. I actually kind of want. Um, All right. Yes. For Scala console, um, to what degree would you say that you can play around with the Chisel stuff? Like, I just want to try something without going through a full Chisel compile process or build process. But I just want to see if like what I'm going to do is going to you know, get what I want. Is there a template for kicking up Scala console in that way? Actually, I think there is. It, it's it, on the on the FAQ. We have an example that you can. Yeah, but it, it's. I, I haven't seen that. Uh, I don't know if you want to look it up, but the there's a, there's a big problem, and that is that um, in the software environment, there's a way that Chisel has to run because of the way that it is designed. So that like when you're creating modules and Chisel hardware components, those are being added to a graph. That graph is in a context that has to be available. But the thing is, if you create your, if you do something like drive, like driver dot execute, and then you pass in like new my yeah, module, but, but that, I think that he's more like what that. happens if I try to do a mux with Some two different oh, arguments, okay. right? You can't. Yeah, at that level. It's very difficult to instantiate hardware in the console, mm -hmm. okay. um, because you have to be in this what's called builder context. Okay. Um, but you can always create a builder context from the command line. You can do driver dot execute or. Something. Yeah, no, you can write code snippets and then yeah. and then do it. I mean, yeah. Like okay. you, there's something called if you look in Chisel, there's something called basic tester. So it's a pretty lightweight framework, but it's still a step away from doing uh, just like, I've always wanted to just, you know, like make a bundle and assign a value to it and then, you know, inspect the bundle and see how that looked. And that stuff is almost, is, is very difficult to do. I would say if you want to do that kind of experimentation, it might be easier just to use the Jupyter notebooks. Like I find those are oh, really okay. nice for yes, doing this that, kind that's of a good push. Point. Okay. That's a good point. It's the, sorry? The what? The Jupyter notebook. The, that's the Chisel Bootcamp the, infrastructure? This, this boot camp uh, is just you can just create cells in that notebook and, and put some arbitrary chisel code in it, yeah. and that does get you in the right build environment so yeah. that the uh, the components work mm -hmm. more like you would expect. Yep, it's not perfect probably when you're doing things in isolation like it usually wants to be within the context of a module, but mm -hmm. it probably will get you most of the way there. Yeah. Do you guys uh, support different platforms? Is everything on Linux, or do you guys also have Windows and Mac? Windows is all supported. Yeah, I think we're. Yeah, each platform has its own yep. unique set of uh, problems. Yes. And, and do but you yes. have a, a preferred developer platform that you release first? No. No. They all uh, all uh, well, I would. S probably Linux, I guess, is. Closest yeah. to I mean, us devs use Linux and Mac, so kind of Unix -y things, but there are also people who, developers who use Windows. So. But you use Windows, right? I use Linux. Oh, you do? Okay. Richard uses Windows, yeah. But they're not lagging behind. You're not losing out. On the no, future. I mean, in that, in that sense, that's we do rely on Scala uh, cross-platform plat you know, compatibility mm -hmm. to get us most of the way there. And mm -hmm. then usually the problems for one platform or the other are getting the libraries that you yeah. need in there, or in the case of if you're using, we use Verilator for one of the back ends. Well, that's a that's not something we support, so you have to be able to build a, a version of Verilator that will work with things. So that's a, that, that's a pain point sometimes with Windows. I would say Verilator is probably easier to get working on Mac and Linux. Yeah. yeah. But if you're, particularly from the, as, as be, since it's a beginner session, I'll say if you're, if you're using the, the templates and just using SVT to, to run unit tests for things, you should be able to work in any environment. Yeah. And it's really when you start one of doing more exotic tool chains and targeting FPGAs and stuff like that that you get into into harder, yeah. more difficult. But I, I, for example, I don't even know if VCS will run on Windows. I think I don't. Like, I, don't know. So I think pretty sure VCS is a Unix thing. Uh -huh. Yeah. So like, if you want to use like proprietary Verilog simulators, then you will have to use Linux. Right. But like a lot of the big tool systems are yeah. Windows based, right? So. <laughs> It's fragmented. I mean, especially in the EDA industry, like a lot of stuff is kind of Unix better. Yeah. 
Yeah, I th say most of the developers in, the in, in our lab use Apple, but um, there's certainly a, a Linux uh, cohort. Mm -hmm. So as you could say, Unix related, Unix like yeah. systems. Unix likes and yeah. yeah. Yeah, any, any questions there in the back? No, no questions in the back? Can the back even hear us? Yep. <laughs> All right. All right. Uh, any other burning questions, or should we move on to the next slide? Let's move on. All right. Yeah, so has anyone curious about why Chisel is considered synthesizable by construction as opposed to Verilog? Oh, what does that mean? Yeah. OK. <laughs> sure. I, I should know this, too. Have, I, have you all read this slide already? <laughs> <laughs> so basically, like if you, Verilog was originally designed as a simulation language. So it's, what's, it's basically you're, you're describing the behavior or you're describing a model of the circuit, not the circuit itself. And so synthesizable Verilog, which is a subset of Verilog itself, was developed after it became widespread. So that's this is kind of it kind of explains why it's very easy to do things like inadvertently create latches and other weird kinds of hardware in Verilog. In contrast, when you're writing when you're running a chisel program, you're kind of explicitly building the circuit itself. So instead of like trying to infer from the behavioral description what is the circuit, you just write the circuit itself. So therefore it's guaranteed to be synthesizable. Whereas when you're doing development in Verilog, you always have to double check that you're not creating latches. You have to make sure you're writing synthesizable stuff. And also you, things like unsynthesizable constructs like delay statements, initial statements, all those things like Chisel does away with because we're not trying to model hardware. We're trying to build the hardware itself. So because you mentioned delays, is there a mm -hmm. way to do something like a clock block so that you could say it's just to make simulation mm -hmm. waveform viewing easier, for example? So I guess you're saying, is there like a, like can you use other clocks? Not just other clocks. Do so you want to mux out a clock from a section of code? Uh, sort of more along the lines of, I think in system variable, you can do something called a clock block that you could, anything that, any clock that is part of that clock block can basically insert a delayed assignment for the purpose of simulation. So you're like, you're inserting a fake delay on the waveform just to view the assignments after the positive yeah. clock. Yeah, clocking blocks. No, I don't think Chisel has any concept of a clocking block. Okay. Yeah. It's Chisel, really yeah. not a procedural language like System Verilog is. I mean, uh, yeah, it's not procedural like System okay. Verilog. It's much more declarative. Okay. It doesn't uh, assume anything about an edge or a delay. Okay. Okay. Yeah. It sounds like if if we were going to support that, that would probably be some sort of annotation that or, would get passed. Or down. something like the test or, because yeah. I think that's more of like a testing sort of simulation oh. construct, whereas mm -hmm. core chisel is about synthesis of building hardware. Yeah, I know. I just said with the in Verilog life, I have to think about that as I <laughs> synthesize full Verilog. Yeah. System. Yeah, so one benefit of writing chisels that you don't have to constantly think about is, is what I write going to be synthesizable? You can, as long as you're not importing exotic things, you're pretty much guaranteed that your block is going to be synthesizable in RTL. All right. Okay, so pop quiz. How many of you know the difference between Chisel and System C? Is Chisel the same thing as System C? Okay, is like Chisel the same as like Vivado HLS? So I'm gonna guess no, but. <laughs> All right, so <laughs> yeah, so the, the answer is no. So those of you who guessed that it's not are correct. So, so Chisel is not HLS, so it's not like you're writing a sequential C program and then having some compiler try and like guess or synthesize a microarchitecture. So that is not what Chisel is about. Chisel is actually you're leveraging functional programming and object in or in the programming to construct hardware. You're not kind of describing a sequential C program and then trying to have a compiler guess what the hardware is. Does that make sense? So you can think about when you run a chisel program, you imagine like the computer is like drawing all these pieces of hardware, muxes, AND gates, OR gates, registers, all these things. Your the compiler is drawing these drawing the circuit. It's not taking like a sequential description like a C, a C program with memory and sequential semantics and while loops and trying to like synthesize FSMs and and uh, control structures. It's not HLS. 
So this also the plus side of that is that it means chisels is zero cost abstraction. So there is no performance penalty to using chisels. Anything, any hardware, high performance hardware you can write in Verilog, you can also write in chisel, but more productively. So, it's so I don't know if uh, the simulation performance we have something later in there, but I'd, I'd like to explore that a little bit because uh, when you're thinking of large uh, system Verilog models, mm -hmm. um, the modeling style. Uh, if you bit blast things, uh, plays a huge role in your simulation performance. Mm -hmm. um, do we have any control over how Chisel translates into Verilog um, and uh, influence the simulation performance of large models? Mm -hmm. So I mean, usually I think we've found that the default Chisel generated Verilog has pretty good performance, and people in the lab use it with VCS and other high-performance simulators, and it works just fine. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, this th this issue does come up. I mean, I, I think in a sense you're the the tools, for instance, analyze like if you have a mux tree or those can be reorganized in ways that are more efficient, right? So that's one. Is, is that the kind of thing you're? Uh, so so uh, for my background, so we we profile VCS outputs mm -hmm. and uh, and basically then go back to our code base and say, well, where are we really spending our, our cycles on? And then mm -hmm. st start modifying our test benches most of the time, and then sometimes uh, how we model our hardware does. Um, and then we get huge benefits in uh, cycles per second um, simulation performance uh, from that. And that, that saves us, in the end, test time. Um, so if Chisel. You say it's uh, zero cost abstraction, but um, I'm, I'm saying I'm <coughs> modifying my simulation yeah. cost by profiling the. the, the I guess you could say zero cost abstraction compared to something like System C or HLS. Okay. Yeah. In this, in the context of this slide, it's compared to like HLS. Okay. And with HLS, you will have a much harder time controlling what the output hardware is compared to with Chisel. So yeah. But is that suggested uh, when using Perl to generate? Chisel. So I guess you're saying why that goes. I, I, I use the Perl to generate the Chisel. Use Perl, the Perl programming language, to oh, generate Chisel code. Python, the, the Kong, the Cat, uh, the script language to generate the Chisel. So I think if you're if you're using these kinds of ad hoc scripting languages, so that kind of asks the question of what what is Chisel good for? Because obviously you can just use other. You can write random scripts to build hardware. And so the idea is Chisel provides you with this principal foundation. You have access to these static. You have access to type safety, object oriented programming, and functional programming. Whereas if you write like Perl or set scripts, you have access to none of those. And it's very easy to make a mistake and have it crash in VCS. Whereas if you're building it in Chisel and you're trying to construct something illegal, it can often catch that up front. Right. So that's one benefit yeah. of using a principal language instead of just ad right. hoc scripts. Yeah. I, th yeah, I think in general, people usually write chisel and chisel, although we've looked at that one project where someone was using uh, the, the, what's the delight follow-up, the Stanford? Spatial. Spatial, mm -hmm. right. But that's, to your question, I, I think chisel generates relatively consistent code from the chisel description that you've given it. So that when, when it comes to optimization or that simulation runs long, you would look at the chisel to say, you know, we could reorganize this in some way and maybe make, you know, Get different QR. Yeah. Um, the other thing is, if you're using like pre processing to generate Chisel, you can probably do that directly using Scala itself. Let's say if you have a Perl script that is snip, stamping out copies of a piece of Chisel code, you can probably just use a for loop in Scala to replicate that. So basically, like, I think because Scala is a very powerful general purpose programming language, often like whatever parameterization that you need to do can be done in Scala itself. So there is generally no need to use yes. pre-processing right. because the reasons not you don't want to. Do. I have a question. You know, um, in in Verilog or System Verilog, we have used the flies to determine all of the timing constraints. Mm -hmm. Still, our you know, uh, you know, critical path, you mm -hmm. know, circuit. How you know? Uh, as I as I know right now, but right now I think we cannot do this in the chisel code. Right. So I mean, UCF but isn't you, part of Verilog itself either. Yeah, right? UCF I, I, is also separate from Verilog. Yeah, actually, I mean, you know, if, if we have the generated, you know, code, Verilog code, mm -hmm. 
it is readable to be able to you know add UCF files for you know uh, can I see you know all of my you know top level you know inputs and outputs and all of the sub modules mm -hmm. inputs and outputs I can do this or not? Yes. So yeah, chisel like the chisel does generate some like a lot of internal notes, but the IOs of the module will be generally no, preserved. All of the sub modules, right? Yes. It's like basically like IOs that you name will be preserved. I, I think I, chisel I, okay, is they, always they preserved. Will, pre preserved. Yeah. Well, I think the question is. You know, in Verilog, you can instantiate a mux or a, or or a flop by the construct you use in Verilog. It's known how it maps to synthesis. So if you want a certain structure in the end, there's certain Verilog you can choose to do it. And the and the question is, can I do that in Chisel? But the answer would be, should you? Is it really, do you really want to take that low level of abstraction up to a higher level language like Chisel in the first place? So you have to trust that Chisel is going to synthesize in a way that meets your timing or meets your area or meets your power. And that's uh, where it breaks, because we don't really know. I think and for I don't you, think you can. So from my experience of working with FPGA tools and UCF, I think those are things where you can specify, like map the IOs to like a, for example, pin on the FPGA board and things like that, right? UCF will let you do those kinds of mappings. So I think he's getting, I believe he's getting more of like, let's say if I have, I'm building a, a design and chisel that I want to put on the FPGA and I want to map this input to that switch, that output to that. And also, yeah. we, no, and, no, and, no. Al and also we have specified the, you know, the, you know, the tolerable delay for a specific mm -hmm. path. So for example, you want to have the, your clock with, you know, a specific frequency. Mm -hmm. So the delay for this clock should be, you know, you know, longer than, you know, okay, more like, than a specific Like delay. specifying constraints for yeah, the clock. Yeah, how can I trust Chisel, you know, that I will have, you know, the, yeah. the strike that will meet my requirements. Right. I, so this is definitely both an issue and th something that people do. So um, it's also, I think, outside the scope of the beginning context. I, I don't, I, I think up through general simulation that we do is, mm -hmm. In unit testing, you probably are not going to hit this stuff. This is more when you're synthesizing. So one thing I should say is like Chisel is not a logic synthesis tool. So Chisel, when you're writing hardware in Chisel, you're building it at the same level of abstraction as RTL. So Chisel is not a logic synthesis tool. It's not like Yosis or Vivado. But, but if our name is, you know, the input and output name is, it will be preserved. So we can. Yes, the, the input and output names will be preserved. So uh, right. Yes. I know the DSP folks have to throw yeah. in timing registers, yeah. all, you know, just to yeah. make things all come up with this, yeah. the IOs at the same our time. Name, so we can yeah. the right. So they put some map. extra ones in there, and then yeah. the, the synthesis tools move those yeah. around to the right spot yeah. so that everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, th I, th that's outside of my area of expertise. Yeah. I know I mean, the, the people who worked on the DSP, Paul, who was downstairs, who presented, and Angie, who was well, I was no. They, they do this yeah. stuff all the time, so there's there's definitely yeah. mechanisms for it. I, I yeah. usually wouldn't hit it at the you know, te yeah. test level. I, I would just say there are like kind of orthogonal concerns that UCF mm -hmm. and stuff like that is more like kind of logic synthesis and physical design, yeah. whereas Chisel is more logic design. They're obviously related, but kind of orthogonal right. concerns. But what good is Chisel if you can't get the gates? Really, what good is it? Well, I mean, well, you it, generates, it. <laughs> it generates Verilog, which you can pass through with Bovado or DC or Genus and get the gates. Agreed. But it has to meet timing, area, and power. I mean, so does Verilog, right? In Verilog, we have a clear path to do it. With yes, Chisel, it's a mystery. No, we can do the same thing in Chisel. Everything you can do in Verilog, with regard to the logic construction that you can do in Verilog, we well, can do Well, you can't say it's just the language that describes RTL because it, that's not its purpose. You ultimately want to get it into a chip. Yeah, so Otherwise, why bother? So it, that's, it, that's true, but... Constraints but, around just a module, right? Like, yeah. That's just... So these are, there are methods. different ways of managing the constraints, and that I, I think that, I mean, if you were to tr try to measure this stuff, you would look at how long, you know, what, does Chisel give you a, a leg up in getting that, that circuit built and tested and running the way that you would like? And then when you hit the synthesis, there are additional things that one must do to, to close timing and do all these other sorts of things. There are practices that, that people, I mean, we build real chips here and they run, and mm -hmm. that's because people have been able to do all that sort of stuff. Yep. Um, I mean, we have like a companion project right. that addresses the right. physical design concerns. Right. And I think we would argue as well that depending on your needs, there are different ways of doing it, including the ability to do your own tooling through fertile passes and other things that could accomplish a lot of this stuff. So, mm -hmm. 
if you want to say I have to be able to describe that at the chisel level, then there might be an annotation saying, you know, the, these things. No, I think that if you can get to, I think that you shouldn't have to describe it at the chisel level. I think you want to raise the level of abstraction away from that. But you have to find out, can Fertile do it, or can you get to, our, you know, there's got to be a place that right, where but, those but factors you, are, are you Right, but considered. if you have critical paths, you might, you know, maybe what you might need to do is identify them, right? You might want to make an annotation saying these two things have to be at some thing, yeah, yeah, and then you would write a fertile pass that would make, that would guarantee that, would, would or analyze that that fertile code and say, oh, we need to throw in a couple registers here because things are not flowing through it the same. So, I mean, so, don't don't get us wrong. We definitely do want to build real <laughs> chips, and we do care about getting to the gates and the layout. Right. Like we definitely care about that. Of course, I had I had the same thought, and the way I convinced myself where chisel adds value is it gives you um, at the next higher abstraction level higher productivity to build larger systems in a very compact code base. Mm -hmm. Uh, at the cost of an additional level of indirection, um, so which makes it harder to find the power converge. And uh, the parameterization. And the parameterization. That's a big deal. But, but uh, the other advantage that Chisel brings is actually um, magnitude uh, improved simulation performance in two level um, simulation, right? So, so this is something that you can, you can use in early testing um, for larger systems without taking it all the way through early on. Yeah. Um, but I mean, you're trading off challenges the, the yeah. way I understand it. I haven't done it through an entire project yet, but um, it's, uh, it, it looks like it's very powerful for, for larger systems that can scale out. Um, and then it, it brings some new challenges and a longer iteration loop to that one added level of indirection. That you, right. that I think that, there. yes, and the, the, I think it is more succinct, which makes it a little easier to comprehend, and it, we are able to do a lot of these things with very small teams. Mm -hmm. so I should say that like annotations are also helping us convey intensive downstream like logic synthesis and physical design tools. So like, I don't know if any of you were at the poster session last night, so I present yeah. on a similar project called Hammer, which is about a physical design generator. And so the idea is in Chisel, let's say if you know that a certain set of registers needs to be retimed, you can annotate that. And then Hammer will take that information and pass it to a logic synthesis like DC, Vivado, or these kinds of tools. So we definitely do care about the physical design concerns getting passed down to the tools. So that is that is important to us, and we value that. So you're, you're taking an annotation all the way down to like place and route? Yeah, we can take an blocking? yeah we can take an annotation from the chisel level, pass it through Fertile, and eventually can go through like synopsis or cadence. Okay. Or and you Vivado. Can do the same for like clocking constraints as well. Yeah. Okay. So do you feel like we've addressed the concern? Or? Yes. Okay. I have a dumb question. Uh, I think there was a question at the back, but then we can yeah. get to it. Uh, does it support uh, asynchronous design software? So what do you mean by that? That's probably related to my dumb question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, looking at your example, I, I mean, when I come to Verilog, I control when things happen and then what happens. But looking at your code snippets of Chisel, there's no description of when things happen. So ch Chisel's main description is basically like Chisel addresses the synchronous digital logic. So basically the idea is a module in Chisel, I mean, to, the default module has an implicit clock and reset. There are ways to do multi-clock and multi-reset designs. So basically like you have registers and then you assign values to registers. At the next positive edge, the value of that register gets transferred to the output. So it always assumes a register. You know, single clock phase register sort of design. So that's the paradigm. that's the that's the default. default. But you know, we have statements like with clock and reset, where you can have, let's say, within a single module, have registers clocked off of different clocks. We support that as well. You can invert clocks. And you can invert clocks and have negative edge trigger clocks and all kinds of things. So by the way, when when we're doing multi clock and chisel, like the clocks don't have to be aligned at all. They they could be out of phase. They could be completely asynchronous with respect to each other. In like a single block, you can't have things happening on the front, on the on the leading and trailing edges of the clock. You just pick one for that block. Oh, yeah. So like by default, it uses the positive edge, but Chisel, pro like if as a designer you want to customize it, we provide the provide an option. Right. And the granularity of yeah. those blocks is is under your control. So if yeah. you say this little piece within this other thing needs to be working, you know, off this edge of this clock, then you can set that up. So then for his question, it goes to clockless. Keeping design logic without a clock. 
I mean, you can you can describe combinational logic in Chisel. I mean, we support it. Yeah. I mean, that's the yeah. default too. Yeah, the, right? yeah. We, we we also support clockless designs. You can have a clockless the module with no clock input. That is also supported. <laughs> yeah. Here we go. Yep. Yeah. So Chisel supports clockless designs, single clock, and multi clock designs. Right. How about latches? Uh, so they're not a native construct, but we can import them using a black box, and then we can use them like any other Chisel module. So we also support latch-based designs in that sense. It's the same way that we support asynchronous resets. So basically, Chisel has a mechanism called black box where you can import kind of arbitrary snippets of, snippets Verilog. of Verilog. So basically, you can describe the latch in Verilog and then import that into Chisel as a module, and then you can just stamp out new latch, new latch, new latch. Okay. So you're constructing the latches explicitly. But there's no like latch next construct or something. We could write one. I mean, it's, it just, it just, you just take a created def latch next and then you wrap a new latch around it. Sure. So that the beauty, one of the beauties of Chisel is that you can easily build your own abstraction. So if you really do want to have a latch next, you can easily write one. So you can have clock and then derive a next clock, negative clock. Um, within the model you build from it and then have both types of latches. Yes, uh, yeah. Both, yeah, both types of clocks or latches. Right. We're doing, we have done quite a bit of work. I would say we're not completely done and that the, the, the testers in particular are mm -hmm. not all the way there in terms of being able to test some, yeah. of, some of this stuff. I mean, you can mm -hmm. always test, generate the Verilog and, and, and test yep. there in a different environment. Yeah. Uh, so we so. do, we, you know, it is an area of active work on the chisel team yep. is to make the clocking yep. better and mm -hmm. uh, easier to yeah. both write and to test. As, and as someone who has done multi-clock designs in chisel, kind of one, you can kind of call it like chisel testing workaround is that I have a simulation clock and then I internally I build a wrapper that divides this clock into a bunch of desired kind of clocks and then we pack that to the DAT. And I have a demo here if you're interested in looking at some multi-clock code in chisel. But yeah, so like we are able to fully describe the circuits and the testing is being brought up to speed. So dumb question, but if I wanted to do double data rate rate and I want that neg edge, mm -hmm. um, is Chisel basically creating an inverter inside the module for me to do that or is it going to abstract it away and know that it's the same clock but it's just doing the negative edge? I, I, I'm just trying to understand mm -hmm. like, the barrel that comes out of it. I trust the process. I just don't know what the bare logic comes like. Okay. So you're saying how does it generate the negative edge? Yeah. It probably depends. So I mean, the really inefficient way to do it is to do an inverter, but that's obviously often not really feasible. Right. So often you need the right kind of physical design constraints and the logic synthesis and place all tools to get it to do the right things. If, when, if you're creating an entirely new negative edge clock, you need to set the right constraints. So sometimes people will. But I think he's asking more like a. Like in a circuit, if if you just create a new wire, which is an inversion of the clock, and then use that, what does that synthesize to? And I think I think does, does it know that it's the same clock, but I'm just using the negative edge of the well, same clock? Well, I think in that sense, I would say probably not. I think the logic synthesis tools are yeah. I think that smart they, enough. they well right. They might not be smart enough. So we w it would appear in this if you looked in the fertile uh, the intermediate representation, there would be a wire, which was the inversion of the clock. So I think that I know like Sci Five has done like neg edge. Right. So what they do, what they did is they actually created a black box like async research reg, but they called it like neg edge reg, like negative edge register, and then they instantiate that in their design, and then that the synthesis tools can know for sure it's the same one, because you still pass the same clock wire, but that register just triggers at the negative edge. So like a neg edge reg black box. So with that, I think they're they're able to get the synthesis tools right. to do the right thing. Right. And this is probably something that could be done with it. Transfer to transform yeah. too. Mm -hmm. It just yeah. So we're, we're talking about uh, with with clock uh, and reset mm -hmm. uh, clock and uh, uh, enable. Mm -hmm. There is a uh, possibility that when the enable uh, when the reset signal come in, uh, all the signal shouldn't be all zero. Some signal should be. Um, Sorry, I'm not sure I followed that question. When 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 the reset signal uh, comes to one module, some of the signal shouldn't be reset to zero. 
So are you saying you want to exclude some registers from being reset? Is that the question? No, I think, I think it's the default state. Maybe one versus. Well, you can specify the the register initialization value. Yeah. So, so there's a construct called reg init, and then when reset goes high, it gets reset to your specified reset value. Okay. But why with clock and the edges of clock uh, or uh, a reset signal doesn't work? Well, with clock and reset are defining a domain in which any reset and clock behavior are using particular wires for those, for that control. Mm -hmm. So uh, I have to look at your specific circuit, which yeah. we would be happy to do yeah, I once think, again offline. Yeah, maybe we can look at your specific circuit offline. And, uh, but like for the general audience, in general, this construct is, let's say if you have a module and you have like a certain set of, a certain piece of logic that needs to use one clock and reset and a certain piece of logic uses another clock and reset, you wrap kind of that second set of logic in this construct, so you just put all the logic in here. It's just yeah, just defining a, a small domain in mm -hmm. which all the registers use a particular clock and reset. Mm -hmm. All right. Yep. Yeah, I'm sure you've already all seen major projects in which is all things like RISC V SOC generators. DSP generators, FPGA simulation, and fault injection. There's a lot of really cool major projects being done in Chisel that are open source and available for use. Did you already go over this? I guess you've already kind of discussed uh, it. I, I mean, I was going linear through your <laughs> slides. Um, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I guess. Maybe we can just go over that. So I guess the, the short answer is yes, Verilog is compatible with, sorry, Chisel is compatible with Verilog and VHDL through the black box mechanism. And through raw module, we can control the top level IOs generated by Chisel. So it makes it feasible to integrate into Verilog designs and whatnot. So one other thing is that Chisel also supports analog and mixed signal designs. So we can integrate analog macros into the design as black boxes. So let's say if you have a PLL macro, we can create a black box for that in Chisel and instantiate and stamp that out and parameterize the construction of that in Chisel. And we can also, I've also, like people have also used Chisel for the like, digital top chip level integration. So especially when you use it in conjunction with a physical design generator. And we've built things like multiprocessor SSDs with high-speed serial links and Bluetooth radios. So just to complete the picture, we have used Chisel to assemble mixed signal designs. Um, you had a nice um, picture with the, yeah, the multi-nest, the different uh, design style. Mm -hmm. um, the second Verilog that you're showing, uh, or, or the, that, does that need to be inline Verilog, or can that be a Verilog module, module that you link in later? It's a Verilog module. So it's not in line. Mm. Well, there's. Actually, I'm not sure what this picture is. So this is no. uh, I, there I can is see a chisel nesting Verilog. I can see right. Verilog nesting so, chisel, but then going yeah, recursively. I don't, I don't actually do the. So you. Well, chisel modules can have in line Verilog. There is a, a basically an annotation right. that says here's the Verilog that. You're going to make a black box out of. I guess what Verilog is instantiating Chisel, you use Chisel to generate a raw module. You, you, you write a raw module in Chisel that generates a Verilog file, and then you link the Verilog In your files. Verilog, in, you yeah. would hook up to the IOs of yep. Chisel. Yep. And That's then what. you can have black box pieces in there. Right. Yes. Link in yeah. Okay. So inside this smaller piece of Chisel, you can have another black box. Right. There's probably a little bit more effort required yeah. to get the wiring right on that. Yeah, it's not, it's not going to auto wire that. Well, maybe, I don't know. Maybe what you can do in Verilog, but. Mm -hmm. Any other particularly burning questions? Has this been tried on a design, say, like a highly uh, regular array like design, so like a GPU fabric or a as opposed to a, a, a performance based API, mm -hmm. or do you have plans? I guess as the as the question that have we have we built like 
highly regular fabrics like GPUs or FPGAs using chisels. So I, I don't think... Well, we built very large vector units. Yeah, very, yeah, very large vector units are highly regular. Okay. Uh, I, and uh, you know, within our group, well, DS, I, I wouldn't, I don't know if this is F, the FFT sort of a regular. FFT, yeah. Um, I do know that uh, at UCSD, for instance, they built, a, as part of the craft program, they built a chip that had, I think, 700 uh, very simplified rocket cores on it, which is probably kind of like that. Mm -hmm. um, like very high I, I, I don't think, I, I, I think Chisel is ideal for the situation, though, the ability to iterate over, you know, one and two dimensional spaces, yep. or three dimensional spaces for mm -hmm. that matter. And, and generate regular grids of yeah. hardware are exactly what Chisel is designed to do. And uh, mm -hmm. in my in the next session, I'll try to get into that a little bit more. But I, but I I think you know I think the vector units are probably one of the better examples we have. The, this uh, UCSD chip, uh, I can't remember. It was Michael Taylor who did that as part of the Craft project. That would be an interesting example. Although I, I didn't, I haven't actually looked at what that code looks like. But I do think that it is, yep. this is right in the wheelhouse of Chisel. This is yep. what Chisel is going to do. Mm -hmm. So it's a very easy to you know, build an M by M grid for a, a few lines to do that in Chisel. Yep. And then, of, of course, what's the appropriate physical design annotations to pass intents to back end tools. Mm -hmm. Does that kind of answer the question? Or? I built a Conway's Life game in Chisel. That's a, that was very easy, and it was uh, it's highly regular, right? It's a peculiar sort of memory. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Will we go over code samples or something eventually, or so far? I mean, should we? It's like he's preaching in the choir. I'd say the yes. We should do it. Let's do you it. don't have to tell us what to believe. We're here to see what, okay. it, what it looks uh, like. No, I think looking at code is a great idea. So if we're, we're you're through your slide presentation? Yeah, I think with the other, the slide presentation, the other thing that's good to note is that we, we also have a library for clock domain crossings that we, we can import and use that for multi-clock design. So that provides synchronization logic between potentially unsafe domains. And this has been taped out in silicon multiple times by Berkeley and Sci-5. I just got a random question yeah. to the audience. How many people here haven't written a single line of chisel ever? I'm, I'm one of them. Just trying to get an idea. So. I'm in, yeah. the, I'm in the single digits. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I think maybe what, what um, people are feeling is that there, there's a tutorial that I, I think we kind of expected something more like a tutorial that we would step through or something like that. I don't know if you could work towards. No, I think I think we're happy to do that. I the, I, I do think the boot camp is largely self-paced, and so even when we we do that, we tend to sit, sit in a room like yeah. this and people busily work through, and then and, we kind of and then we blow it around the room and blow help. around and help, and yeah. I think that works quite well. Um, if we get to the end of our materials, I don't have an objection to doing that or looking through some stuff. Yeah. But I, but I think the big opportunity here is is mostly to be able to ask direct questions yeah. of two people who have worked in the bowels of yeah. Chisel quite a bit. So yeah. I would like to take yeah. optimal, you know, as much yeah. advantage of that as we can here. Yeah. But I think looking at code is a good way to spur questions. So mm -hmm. I, we should do it. We can look at some of the yeah. the boot camp examples, and yeah. and I'm sure you'll have some questions. Mm -hmm. So we can yeah. let's start. Yes. I want to basically take your question from uh, what is it good at uh, and turn around. In your experience, uh, where do you think Chisel is not as well suited as maybe existing solutions, uh, and and where is it harder to read or where? So, so that, that that is one thing because then mm -hmm. maybe that would guide which pieces of my design I would keep maybe modeling in Verilog that or system Verilog that I understand already. Um, and then the, the other question, independently, so, sort of, yesterday in one of the presentations, or I think Google was uh, saying that, uh, well, the, the, it's a very powerful approach and, and not very powerful, but I don't want to give that power to every, each and every designer on my team. So uh, I, I want to basically restrict them voluntarily to um, the safe constructs um, that are uh, intuitive to use. 
Um, so you having had lots of uh, interactions with first time users and intermediate users, um, which are the constructs that uh, people are struggling with, especially if they don't have a Scala background? The it's most a good people don't have Scala background. Yeah. I try to put it uh, um, shizzle. It's not the most convenient ever because of Scala. Uh, Scala. But you get used to it. Yeah, Scala introduces is a is a is a bar. Um, yeah, the the Google's and uh, talk is an interesting case. I think they they've done a lot with it. Um, they basically forked two years ago, yeah. and you know they did a bunch of things. And at, during that same time, it, 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 what? Oh, yeah, I was gonna say like they forked like over two years ago on an old version of Chisel, where it was like we at Berkeley had made right. significant. And actually, for the first that. year, there was quite a bit of interaction where we were trying to keep up and have some agreements of sort of you know the problems that we were doing. I, I don't know. It, it's kind of hard to answer that. I, I think it's a good question. Is like if. If you have some junior engineer, is there a way of telling them what to avoid or what, or some limiting what they can do in Chisel? And I don't, I'm not sure that, I'm not sure there's an answer to that question other than you should, I, which is, it will be in the next session here, is I, code review is really a big deal. And I think because the code, I would argue for the most part in Chisel is more readable, it's more doable to do that code review. So, uh, you know, if you don't want people to use certain things, you should just look over their code and make sure they don't. I think the other, I'm gonna, in, in addition to Chick's excellent answer, I'm gonna approach the question from a different angle and say it's kind of one set of skills is required to write harbor and another set of skills is required to build a library. So I think there is kind of a, a, a bit of a difference between this amount of skill required to write a new library and versus the amount of skills required to use a library. I think that is kind of an important distinction. Like, for example, I, like we, in one of the as we had an SOC design class at Berkeley, and we were able to get, for example, a whole bunch of undergrads and uh, new master students to learn Chisel within a few weeks and build like productive designs in within like half or one semester. So in terms, if you're just using libraries or using Chisel, then it's definitely very easy to learn and pick up. But if you want to write something like diplomacy or rocket ship or DSP tools, I think that is like right. you really have to know Scala to write DSP tools. But to use DSP tools, you don't have to be as skilled as the DSP tools developers. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a critical distinction there. Do you want to use a library or do you want to make a whole new library? Because that is a whole new set of skills and requires more advanced Scala knowledge. So maybe that's kind of the complementary view of looking at skills required to use Chisel. So it depends on, do you want to use abstractions or build new abstractions? Right, and I think, yeah. So the other the other area probably where this is is the um, one of the big we think selling points of Chisel is the the generation the, the code generation and the parameterization. So if if you sat down for some very small module and wrote the lines of Chisel and wrote the Verilog, they might be seem very comparable. They wouldn't take a whole lot more. But with with not too much more addition in the in the Chisel side, you could add that and make that block you have, you know, usable in different situations yep. with multiple yep. IOs or different widths on everything, yep. and you can generate a whole bunch of different stuff. Mm -hmm. So I, I would say with the junior engineers, you would probably not have them generating highly parameterized code that makes many different instances, but instead would say, you know, we just need a block that does that. And they, they could have done that in Verilog, and it would be roughly the same amount of work, but it should be yeah. should be pretty much as easy, the same mm -hmm. amount of effort at, in Chisel. Yeah. And I think building on top of that as well, like the idea is, let's say, imagine if I don't know, out of my organization I have some engineers who have written some highly parameterized code. The other engineers can leverage that code easily and adapt it for different modules. Like you saw in the TPU talk, they, between five different instances of the TPU, they shared 60% of the code. So imagine like the more advanced engineers might write the kind of the shared code in common and the other engineers can take that and easily parameterize it and reuse it for different instances. So that is also, the barrier to using an a generator is much lower than the barrier to writing a fully advanced generator. So that is also kind of an, another angle to think about it. I have another dumb question. Yes. Um, when you look at high level languages, um, I thought that's a pretty good job of running anywhere, but Java, which was designed to run anywhere, failed at doing that. And well, now you have something that's, you know, sort of, I've been hearing is targeted at C 
simulators and FPGAs and you know ASIC hardware and stuff. And the FPGAs are all different environments too. How is it doing it at, at running everywhere? I mean, do you have to take it into account specifically, or is it doing a pretty transparent job, or how's that going? So, is, so just to check if we've understood your question correctly, you're, you're asking how does Chisel generated RTL run on map to different platforms? Is that the question? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I think there is kind of two ways to approach that. One way is that it's true that let's say if you have a set of RTL, if you're mapping it to FPGAs, you need to use like BRAMs, block RAMs, and things like that. If you're mapping it to ASIC, you need to use SRAMs, and that's one example where like the te underlying technology is different. So I think the real answer here is. I'm going to quickly jump back to the slides. So we stole this idea of a compiler from software. So just like in software, you have all these different projects that need to compile to all these different platforms. In hardware, we have projects like Boom, Rocket, Focha, and all these different projects that map to ASIC, FPGA, et cetera, right? And as I mentioned, one example is memories are different on FPGA than ASICs. So the idea is in Chisel, you kind of describe your memory at a higher level. You just write, write you can abstractly write a mem. And then we have a fertile compiler path that maps it to either like BRAMs or ASIC SRAMs. So that's one example of how the fertile compiler enables your RTL to run on different platforms. It's because is we that, can. Is that some special argument we pass to fertile and build that? As, like, I'm just curious how you do that. Oh, like the actual mechanism? Yeah. So there's a. I don't. There's an annotation, right? Yeah. What, yeah. The, the canonical way would be you pass an annotation right. to that memory, and then so at I some point. So that's block RAM. So I think the way that we like actually do it is that we have a fertile, like basically we generate the fertile file and then we read it in and run a specialized memory transform pass. That memory transform sucks out the generic memory and then sticks in like a set of ASIC memories. And then we pass that off as downstream ASIC tools. You can replace SRAMs with VRAMs with FPGAs. Okay. Yeah. So we basically we have a pass that like fertile goes in, it goes in, sucks out the memories and sticks in the technology map stuff. And you can imagine doing this for other technology dependencies. I mean, the reason why I'm asking is because I'm curious is that I work with FPGAs, and mm -hmm. there are times when I'm not sure if it's inferring the use of a register in the block RAM tile, mm -hmm. or it's putting it into the fabric nearby, and mm -hmm. that can make a difference. Yeah, we can talk offline about this as but well, because I, 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 like, I'm one of the developers who works on like the ASIC memory pass, and we probably it's not that difficult to extend that to F, FPGA and whatnot, so we can talk about that offline, about the concrete details needed to get that done. Okay. Yeah. But the short answer is yes, we have fertile technology mapping passes that enable portability. I think check that. Is, yes. Yeah. No, I, I agree with that. I, I would just say that's, I, I don't know how much that was your question versus the sort of the Java JVM no. thing, which I. Well, you don't have to solve Java. <laughs> <laughs> but but that's, that's basically the question, right? You're targeting different types of. Yeah, yeah I, it's a kind of a loose analogy. Right. I, I think the analogy is actually pretty good. Uh, and Python does a pretty good job of being portable across platforms. But where things get complicated is if you use exotic libraries. Say you're doing math processing, and you know you've got this, this, and you're, you, you know, I used to work with JIT stuff with Python. So you, you know, you have different C's, and it was you could always get into this nightmare stuff. Java is kind of the same. If you're just using running vanilla Java, you can pretty much run your code, which Chisel is largely vanilla Java because the output of Chisel is uh, fertile, and that's so it doesn't have to do all this exotic stuff. It doesn't have other compilers. So that's leading me to my next dumb question. Yeah. <laughs> I don't really know. I, I mean, I'm really new to the whole thing, so I kind of understand what the ch Chisel's doing now and how it slots into things, but I don't really understand the fertile and how it slots into things. How is it different than regular RTL? Parameterized well, RTL, or is it? Well, it's a, a well-defined regular language, and it's it, unambiguous. So it's uh, extremely deterministic what it does. Which also one thing is, fertile is not like fertile is not RTL design. It's a compiler. So basically, it's a program that takes in RTL and changes it, but it does. A fertile doesn't write RTL by itself. That's well, it it, it can it, emit things. It, it emits. But I guess my point is like GCC doesn't write your code for you, right? Like GCC takes in your code and spits out code. GCC doesn't write code. Right? Yeah, it's not an accurate because GCC you end up with an executable and fertile you end up with another form of fertile. Yeah, so I guess like fertile is not a software compiler. It's a it's a RTL to RTL the, the compiler. The IR and fertile stand for an intermediate representation. So when yeah. you compile your your C code. The C compiler, the very first step is to parse it and to turn it into some kind of a tree structure. 
And then from there, the entire game is just make passes on that tree structure, changing things around, optimizing, collapsing constants, inlining. Um, and then the very last step is to then do your actual code generation. So Fertile would be sort of analogous to this sort of hidden step that you don't usually see, like LLVM might be something you might. Well, I think LLVM is very large. But I think even at the bottom of the LLVM chain, there's probably an assembler yep. That's, yep. Trans that's doing the final right. layer of translation. And that's sort of the same as at the fire final level of Fertile, you're going to Verilog, which is their assembly language. And then there's still layers below that, depending on what downstream tools you're using. Yeah. A few minutes ago, you mentioned, uh, you know, say, uh, uh, SRAM versus uh, uh, block RAM, uh, mm -hmm. sensing it, and uh, <coughs> being cognizant of that. <coughs> Is that tightly coupled with your downstream backend to the camera? <coughs> Sorry, it's, it's the, it's the question, uh, so it's like, the technology mapping passes in Fertile, is that coupled to a specific backend tool or is that reusable across different backend tools? Is that the question? Yes. Uh, I think the answer is that it's it's not coupled to any particular backend tool. Like once it does the memory mapping, you can pass it to any synthesis placement route tool of your choice. I don't I don't think it's coupled to any particular tool. Right. But for a given project, you probably will establish one or two, yeah. uh, some small number of workflows, and you're going to start at the top yeah. and work your way down. And at various stages of in there, you may employ a like a particular fertile pass along the way that you want because of the back end that you're targeting. Mm -hmm. And there's no way of really escaping building a, a, you know some sort of flow. I think there's a question. Yeah, you said um, earlier that fertile uh, that, that, that there was a file format associated with that. Mm -hmm. Would it be possible to see an example just to kind of get a concrete idea? The fertile file. Do we have those checked in anyway? Yeah, I don't know if there may be a binary file oh. format or something. Oh. Or, um, you, want to, you want to read Fertile itself? I'm just kind of curious what kind of... Okay, so there's, uh, there's two reasons. I, 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 we'll find some Fertile. Um, let's try to think of where... Oh. And is Fertile independent of um, Chisel in general? I, I, I was wondering if um, it was sort of its own... <laughs> This is one of my complaints about uh, most programming language compilers is that the intermediate representation is so closely tied in all cases to, except for, I guess, LLVM is making an exception to that. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it would be really handy as a programmer to be able to yeah. sort of drill into those back end tools and sort of a, without having to invoke the compiler in sort of mm -hmm. arcane black magic ways. So this is yeah. fertile. So, sorry, okay. Um, so there's a couple of, I mean, Fertile is easy to get to, and if you're using Chisel, I think one of the first things in the Chisel, uh, Chisel boot camp is saying, how do I get Fertile? And there's a yeah. little example, or how do I get Verilog in there? Yeah. I think there's on, on, in the there. FAQ, there's one, right. there's an entry. In the Fertile project, there is also an official document which describes very rigorously what Fertile is. Like the spec. Right. Um, and we probably should include that. Uh, Adam who was speaking yesterday has, done, has a very good talk that d describes like some of the the ambiguities that are present in Verilog and why it's so dangerous yeah. and and those ambiguities really don't exist mm -hmm. in Fertile. Fertile is very rigid yeah. about what you can connect to what and do that and so Chisel is the front end that given this high level description makes sure that you're constructing a circuit that's going to play by the rules that, uh, that we've all agreed upon. And I, I just wanted to answer your question about is Fertile independent of Chisel? And the answer is yes, you can run Fertile independently from Chisel. Mm -hmm. They're not coupled together tightly. So it, just looking at the Fertile briefly here, you, I mean, it's it's fairly straightforward to read. It's a it's a little verbose. Uh, one of the reasons is one of the reasons is verbose is it has line number information for where stuff came from from above. So that makes every line look a little denser and uglier than uh, than it might otherwise. But essentially, there's a, a circuit which represents sort of the, a container for the top level stuff. And then modules, the modules describe first their, I, their IOs, and then the, the code. So the code is usually fairly simplistic, uh, single assignment type stuff. So there's like one thing on the left, and you know, uh, like one operation or, or definition on the right of like a Declare a, declare a wire, you can declare a wire, declare a register, or things like right. that. Right. Is it, it flash that's always, or is it? Um, sorry? It, 
Do, does it preserve the data types in there, or is it like, a five-bit representation? Well, no, it, the data types are, are Fertile has a set of data types that it supports. So um, somewhat randomly, I picked a, a Fertile file here that actually has some one of our new types in here, which is called an interval. So you and can actually see, so you can actually see, see that on the right wire there. there. There's the type. So now, the type. now, one of the reasons we're doing intervals, so this is a little side foray here, is that intervals, you can specify not just like how many how many bits you want a wire to be, but instead you can say, here is the numeric range that this wire will take on. Because, and and so, and it also supports a lot of inference, so like from through various operations. So the, the canonical example is, if you take, uh, you do add six one-bit wires together, you end up with a six-bit result, right? Because each add, add has a carry, and each carry goes over. So six adds, you get six, and maybe it's seven. Um, but if you if you consider the intervals, you can say that a one-bit wire can only have a value of zero or one. So the biggest number you can get by adding six six one-bit wires together is actually the value six, which only requires three bits. So intervals implicitly contain all this logic, so that you can really minimize wires in very big designs. DSPs circuits are a good example, and we've done some uh, work with that. So this is a new data type that we are adding to Chisel and Fertile, which will let that. So that we are, at the moment, witnessing that. And the question marks mean here that this particular wire, we're going to let the Fertile compiler figure out what those widths ultimately have to be at the end. So at the end, when we emit, we will have resolved all those question marks and know exactly what that wire should be. But at the moment here, as it came out, this is a, as it comes out of the, the yeah. chisel front end, mm -hmm. we have not figured out that out yet. So there might, I'm guessing here, but I'm, you, there might be a path that you can run it through and it will just um, infer all of those questions. Exactly, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. A pa compiler pass will infer those. Right, right. so fertile, yeah, fertile pass. And to briefly answer the question, like whatever data types that fertile supports, which includes bundles, which are kind of like structs, so those will be preserved and not bit blasted in the fertile. Right. Ultimately, when you're lowering it to the very end to a Verilog or VHDL, there's a pass that will expand those, but right. before that, it will fertile preserves that information. Yeah, okay. so you can see, so we declare a wire here, we, de we declare a node, which is like, this is a little temporary, and it's the subtraction of this wire and some other value. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of, because it's very tight, rigorous, you, there has to be explicit coercions to move things from one type to another, and mm -hmm. that's all been checked and will be checked further as, as we go through the thing. Uh, one thing you notice here is uh, at the top level, high fertile contains, allows a when construct, which is very similar, is you know, direct product of the chisel when. So that is not synthesizable, and before it can, you know, as we move down the, two, the uh, fertile passes, all winds will be eliminated and replaced with mux. So at this point, uh, a given wire may have many references and assignments because it's in the scope of all these winds. But by the end, a wire can only have one a single assignment, and that may be from a whole bank of muxes for all the different things that are involved in, in, in assigning that. So that's. So though I think there was a question. So just a logistical question: the people developing chisel are not the people developing fertile. There is... There's a fair amount of overlap. I think it's like a Venn diagram. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it is. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I work on I work on both. Uh, I don't know if you've done this much fertile, but... Because uh, I've done... Because I, I see posts about chisel updates and posts about fertile updates yeah. separately. Right. Uh, I think that's... Well, I mean, they're two distinct re repositories, and they are... They are different. I mean, Fertile is, is a, a compile. It's really a compiler environment. Yeah. Uh, you you do passes. You do transformations that you want to have certain guarantees as to what the product of those transformations is. That it, that is a, a intellectual discipline of its own. On the Chisel side, most of our development is concerned with uh, you know ease of representation, uh, you know expressibility of certain types of mm -hmm. functions that people want. Um, right. And yeah, it's it's pretty different, you know. And it, the main goal is to get fertile out of there that we can then chew on. But broadly speaking, if you take chisel three mm -hmm. dot two, you better get fertile four dot five or yeah, whatever. Yeah, there's there is versioning. 
Yeah, the, there's versioning, and we make sure they work together. Right, and that's why we have a, a person dedicated yeah. to just that job. That's uh, Jim Lawson. Yeah. And actually, like, I think one of the, what Jen's helps helping to set up is that say we PR a change to Fertile. We don't want it to break Chisel, so we have continuous integration that always makes sure that they both work together. So we Jenkins. have yeah Jenkins. Yeah. How exciting! Okay, so this is Fertile code. Um, depending, I, I look at it a lot. I, I, you know, at, at the debugging level, it's, it's one of the places you can look. You can you know, see various steps along the way, and sometimes you want to see the various transformations, what happened. So do you want to pick a piece of chisel, or do you want to do, look at some of the sort of interesting? Yeah, I think we're out of time. Do we have a break in between? Is that how it works? Yeah, yeah there's a break. Sorry? Everybody else already started the break. All right. Well, <laughs> okay, yeah, we should I think a lot of you are, are coming right back. We might as well go on a break, take a little break, and uh, and then yeah. the main difference is that uh, Edward and I are going to switch chairs. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And we, we'll share the slides as well so you can know how to access Thank you. Thank you.